Hello. Hi, James. Great to have you here today. How are you? I'm doing very well, thank you. Sorry, I've never used on hop in before, so I'm, I'm getting prepared. All set. All right. Excellent. So just a quick introduction. James is the co-founder of Red Crew, and he has been instrumental in leading the development of the banking status uh, for the consumer data rights regime in Australia. Um, he will be giving us a reflection on open banking API design. So I can see you're sharing the screen, James. So please go ahead and uh, yeah, enjoy. Okay. Uh, thank you, Sarah, and uh, thank you for anybody who's there, and thank you, Tim. I enjoyed that, uh, listening to his talk while I was sitting in the backstage. Um, I noticed that a couple of people were talking about open APIs in regards to health in the back end of there for some of the questions. Um, this is the talk for you. I'm all about open open APIs. Um, so I work for a company called Red Crew, or founded a company called Red Crew. Um, the our our purpose is about digital transformation, etc. But one of the that's one of the things that I've been doing. Um, as as on the contract is working for the federal government, focusing on building out the consumer data right. Um, so I've been the lead architect for the open banking APIs that have been created for the consumer data right, which have just been progressively going live for the last 12 months. Um, so the four major banks have built a lot of those APIs and the second tier banks are now building them out. So really this talk is about a reflection of the journey to date and where we might go next with open banking APIs in Australia, but also open economy. So um, APIs in other sectors as well. Um, so um, I will see if I can figure out how to move my slides. Right, okay, so the first thing, I'm, this is a fairly short talk. Um, so I'm gonna go through on power, power mode, um, just to give you a bit of the background of where we're at so we can get to more time for Q&A and more time for talk about the future. Um, so the, Q, the consumer data right uh, was effectively established um, after a productivity commission and then federal um, the federal treasury inquiry, sometimes called the Farrell Report, um, basically recommending that um, open banking should occur and then the inquiry was how do we do that. One of the interesting things about that inquiry is, to, is that it didn't just say, hey, we should do banking like the UK and other jurisdictions have done. We should do the entire economy. Um, and that was a fairly um, radical thing for that inquiry to do. It was even more radical for the government to agree to it. Um, but that's essentially what we've, what we've been doing. Um, and this is a quote from the, um, the documentation from the actual Treasury website. Um, the whole purpose of the consumer data right is to empower consumers and customers. Uh, and this is an interesting um, uh, thing to call out at the beginning. Uh, a lot of people ask me about this, you know, or what do you think about open banking? I actually don't like the term open banking. Um, I like open banking. I like APIs for banking. I, I used to work at NAB and I built a lot of APIs for NAB and designed a lot of APIs. Um, but really, um, I don't like the term open banking with regard to the consumer data, right? Because what we're trying to do is much more than banking. Um, when you talk about open banking, you tend to focus on the bank. Um, what does the bank do? What, what can you do with the bank? Whereas the consumer data, right, is really focused on the consumer. What should the consumer be able to do? What control should they have? How should the consumer be able to do things? And that's a fairly fundamental psychological shift, but it's a because it's psychological, it tends to influence everything. And it's a fairly major differentiation between a consumer data right regime and an open banking regime. Uh, so the progress to date, um, so far we've got Four banks have implemented authenticated APIs. We've got about 23 banks, and actually I was checking this morning, and I think it's 24 now, have implemented the product reference data. So the product reference data is unauthenticated data about banking products. You know, so this is if I went to buy a credit card, how much what the, would the rate be, what would the fees be? And that's in a standard form, so you can compare products easily. And the authenticated APIs are things like, well, what accounts do I have in transactions and payees and direct debits and my customer data and a whole bunch of stuff um, that the banks hold, which you can then direct them to share to a to a, a, an accredited entity. Um, so that's not a trivial number of um, implementations. By this, by July next year, we'll probably have between 120 to 150 um, uh, banks doing the authenticated APIs, and we'll by by October we'll have about that number in the product reference data. So they're coming up to various compliance milestones. Um, to date, we've done about 2 million API calls. That's pretty low. 
Um, it's a big number, like say two million, but you know, this um, by this time next year, we'll probably be talking the hundreds of billions. Um, we're also now working on the second sector, which is another reason I don't like talking about open banking quite so much because we're now doing electricity. Um, again, we're doing the same sort of thing, electricity usage, customer records with your electricity retailers, detail about the physical hardware at your site, those kinds of things. But also um, your billing history, your statements, um, your current plan and our unauthenticated plans. So we're now moving into the energy sector and that's I'm currently leading the development of the energy, energy sector standards to define those APIs. Um, so the standards is um, really been my focus for the last two years. So, um, and obviously API days is, um, uh, this is the strategy stream, but we're still a fairly technically oriented um, uh, conversation. So um, a lot of what I'll be talking about now will focus on the standards themselves. So where are the standards at? Um, we've been developing them now for about two and a half years. Uh, it's a bit under that, but getting close. We've done 90 separate consultations. Uh, now, unlike when I was at a bank designing APIs, um, uh, I didn't do consultations. I didn't go out to the market and say, how do you think NAB should build its accounts API? That was not a thing. It's not a thing you're doing in the corporate scenario. When you're doing it for the government, you actually have to go and ask everybody and get people's feedback because governments consult good governments in particular. Um, we have taken an approach of radical transparency with that. So we've done a lot of very small consultations. How do we think we should do this API? What, how do you think we should do error handling? How do you think we should, um, what principles should be used for governing these APIs? And we've done about 90 of those over the last two and a half years. Um, so on average, at any particular time, we've got one or two consultations going continuously. We've had hundreds of contributors um, dozens of organisations, but hundreds of individuals and thousands of individual contributions and pieces of feedback. Um, and every week we have an implementation call with people that are asking questions and how do we do this? And we get like, we get regularly get over 100 people on that call. And if there's anybody here who's interested in this, at the end of this pack, which I'm assuming will be shared at the end, um, there's a whole bunch of links to how you can get any of that information. Um, essentially, the CDR standards have not been written, they've been technically written by me, as in I've said at the, I've actually created the swagger, but they've been developed by the community. The community, it's been a fairly significant community effort to um, bring everything together. So it's been the wisdom of the crowd that has really done these standards. Uh, so a bit of an overview of the standards themselves. Um, the process, um, uh, how, for developing the standards, and I talked about using the community, has been really driven by experience with um, open banking um, in the past. Um, uh, sorry, with open source practices in the past. Um, so when you think about, you know, working on um, open source projects, you know, when you all your NPM modules for your node developers or, you know, just creating libraries in GitHub or SourceForge or GitLab or any other these sorts of organisations, there's a process that open source um, communities actually use. We were very heavily influenced by that. Um, so we've been highly iterative. We don't do... Um, lots of um, um, big one, the big consultations where we say, here's six months and write your big documents and then we'll do a thousand decisions in one go. We do lots of very small submissions. Um, we'll take feedback from literally anybody with a GitHub account. Um, we do not judge the feedback by the author or the organisation they represent. Uh, which has been quite amusing. Um, all of the submissions are public, so you can go and have a look at them. So you can go and have see um, early on a lot of the submissions from the major banks where we don't support this approach and things like that, to which the response was, well, why? You know, I can't, I can't work with I don't support it. That's meaningless. You have to say why you don't support it, what would be better. Um, whereas the individual contributors who had been used to you know, using these tools would say, hey, don't do this, do this instead because we think this will be better. And that's really helpful feedback and it's really usable feedback. So a lot of a lot of the standards have actually been influenced by just interested people, um, not people that work for banks necessarily. A lot of them do, but really a lot of the standards have been influenced more by, um, uh, if you like, uh, interested citizens 
uh, not even necessarily citizens of Australia, but just interested people um, rather than large organisations, which I particularly like. Um, but also we've been very iterative with it, lots of small things uh, to try and build up. Uh, it's been primarily done on GitHub and there's some links there uh, to the actual sites, um, which you can go and have a look at if you like at your leisure. And in fact, I encourage you to do that. Uh, one of the reasons I do presentations like this is advertising. Um, this is an awesome community at API Days. I would love everybody who attends API Days to come and make submissions on the APIs, particularly if they come and tell me they're bad, because as long as you give reasons, because if you come and tell me they're bad with good reasons, we can make them better. Uh, if you also, it's nice if you come and tell me they're awesome, but that's just a that's just like a sugar hit. It just makes me feel good, but it doesn't actually make them better. Um, so please come along and participate. That would be awesome. Okay, so um, the next two slides I have, um, I'll just give a bit of an open in, um, intro to. Um, what we've done with a consumer data right is pretty different to any other public standard. Um, You've got lots of public standards, ISO and RFCs and um, NIST and so on and so forth. And there's fairly regimented ways of doing these standards. Uh, what we're actually trying to do here though is not a standard which is then, hey, there's the standard, people can implement it if they like. Uh, this is actually a regulatory environment. So there's dates and people have to implement it. So it's not just a standard development, it's a regime development and a delivery attached to it. So it makes it a lot more visceral. Also, it's not sectoral specific, it's cross sector. So we've had some fairly significant challenges figuring out how to do this. Um, and we haven't been able to follow um, standard practice or use standard tools. Um, so the first question is, how do we avoid creating a camel? You know, there's the old adage saying that uh, a camel is a horse developed by committee. So one of the biggest challenges we've got is if you're getting thousands of submissions, and a lot of them are contradictory, how do you actually create something that's good. And I, I like to flatter, flatter myself and think that we've created something good. Um, it's definitely working and it's implemented and it's um, it hasn't changed much from a lot of the initial things we've put in place. And uh, it's pretty clean uh, and elegant, which is what you're looking for in an API standard. But um, there was a real challenge early on about how to do that. Um, and so one of the, that's been, if, if I can give one of the, you know, insights into the process that we've gone through is we've had to be very much um, open to all challenges, but be very strong in how we respond to them. Uh, just because somebody says something doesn't mean it's right, for instance. And getting that balance right has been very, very important. How do we manage change in a complex network? Now this one, there's been a number of um, talks I saw on versioning and various things like that. This is a really critical one. Uh, um, our standard is not a typical API standard where an organization develops APIs and says, if you want to use them, they're here. You know, so if you're familiar with a Google API, Facebook API, Stripe API, or even the NAB API, or Macquarie API for existing banking ones, um, they're owned by an organization that says, here's an implementation, go and use it. So it's a many to one, many clients, one server. Um, that's pretty standard. Um, and if you then take a lot of the other standards that are out there like OIDF standards or the Kantara initiative or NIST or any of the other things that are out there, technical standards, RFCs, et cetera, um, a lot of them are here is a standard and you can implement it. Um, here's a reference implementation, but there's a lot of flexibility. And if you go to two different implementations, they'll be vastly different. What we are doing is many banks, to many clients. And if the banks all do it differently, the clients break. They might work on five banks and break on another five. And if the clients all build it differently and you know interpret the standard differently, they also won't work. Um, that's hard enough to get the first baseline version one standards done. What happens then when you introduce change? And now the banks have to change their APIs. Um, or their information security profile or any of their implementation, the way they handle errors, for instance. Um, and three of them change and two of them don't. Now the clients have three that work one way and two that work a different way. How do you manage that? How do you manage discoverability of evolution and change? Um, and a lot of the mechanisms that have evolved in the API industry about that, um, frankly, don't cut it. 
you know, semantic versioning is awesome. Block versioning is great. Um, but we've had to use just about all the tools in the tool toolbox. We've used um, OIDC discovery. We've used um, different mechanisms so a client can figure out whether a bank supports a feature or not. We've used endpoint versioning. We've used block versioning. We've used semantic versioning. We've used a whole bunch of things. But we've had to come up with a mechanism for doing that. And it's a really hard problem. Um, and how do we manage the contradictions? Um, it would be so easy if everybody just, if I could just go away and build an API and then everyone implement it, that would be awesome. Um, but we're doing it in public. We're doing it transparently. So we have contradictions. So people will say to us, don't be prescriptive, give us flexibility. And then sometimes people from the same organization will say, can you clarify exactly how this thing works and then put that in the standard so I don't get in trouble when I do it that way. And we will get that feedback from the same company, same bank, same organization, et cetera. Um, sometimes we get it from different organizations where one will say, you're being too, you're a bunch of Nazis, you're being too onerous. And another group will say, you are leaving too much flexibility, we can't implement this, you, you need to tell us what to do because we don't have a deep IT capability. So we get both of those sides. Um, so we want, some groups want certainty. So you need to set the standards and then don't change them for nine months. We need nine months lead time, 12 months lead time, 15 months lead time. You need to specify these things and then leave them alone and we will implement. And then another group will say, I know we're going live next week, but we found a problem. Can you change the standards? Now, again, we've had that feedback from the same organizations. Um, this, is a, this is a problem. Um, and another one is plan for the future. Could you please plan for the future? We need to know what you're going to do next November. We need to know what's gonna happen in 2022. Combined with the, the other contradiction was we have no idea what the future is. We don't know what's gonna be designated next. We don't know how the, these APIs are gonna evolve. We don't know what's gonna happen with technology. How do we give certainty for the future and plan and, and versus not having a clue? Um, they, anybody who's working in large complex organizations will see some of these contradictions, but we have them writ large in public every single day. Um, and that's been some of the challenge of what we've had to deal with. So things that have worked. Um, so these are the things that how we've worked with the cha those challenges and made them actually successful, or at least as successful as we could. Um, the first one was um, focus on the community first. Um, there's a reason that we have lots of contributions. Um, and it wasn't just because it's it's required to comply. That's obviously a contributing factor. But uh, we've worked hard on actually getting um, engagement. We've had workshops. We've invited people. We've got, had bilateral and multilateral meetings. We've gone to industry groups and given speeches and talks. I do things like this. We, we reach out because we want the community to contribute and we ask them to contribute. And when they do contribute, we take the contribution seriously and we change the standards as a result in many cases. So uh, that's something that I would say has actively worked. If you want to do a standard, but you don't want anybody to tell you how to do it, and then you expect them to be engaged with it, you just won't, just won't happen. Uh, the next one is always play the ball, don't play the man. Um, um, people get tetchy, you know, um, we don't like the way you're doing this. Oh, thanks very much, but I'm not going to change it because of this other consultation and other feedback. Oh, you must do. I must change it. Oh, we're being ignored. Blah blah blah. You can't play the man. You can't hold grudges. You you actually have to play the content at all times, and that's really hard in a public context when you're doing public policy because different people have different. You know, it might be a surprise to people, but sometimes people try and lobby for particular outcomes, and they have agendas. And sometimes you have to put all of that aside and just say, is this feedback good or not? Um, and this last one is the hardest. Um, when you think you're right, you're stubborn. Um, you hold the line to good. If you think it's good, you stick with it. If you think it's right, you stay with it. And when you've shown information that says it's wrong, you eat humble pie and say, you know what? I held to this for a year, but I was wrong. This is better and change. Um, for a lot of engineers, stubborn is easy. It's the humility part that sucks. Um, I am definitely in that camp. The humble does not come easily. Um, so, but this, the humble part is the critical part because everybody gets stuff wrong. Uh, and for us, I think that's been really critical. There have been a number of things where we've gone for a long time thinking we'll do it X and then we found out that sucks. And so we've changed it to Y and we've had to do that. Okay, so I might just do a time check. 
Is my clock going? Oh, I think I'm going okay. Okay, so this is the really the crux of um, where we're going next, and then I'll open it up to Q and A. And it's very hard for me. I'm not a politician. I'm not. I'm a, I'm a consultant. I'm not a decision maker in where the regime goes or what the government does, um, and I don't seek to be. Um, so I'm not going to say this is what we should do for the CDR. Um, but I, so I'll ask, I'll instead say, this is my hopes for the future. Um, the consumer data right is economy wide. It's fairly radical. It's globally unique in an approach to a problem that many jurisdictions are trying to solve. Um, and I think it's um, quite exciting. Um, so I do have hopes for the future. So I'll articulate this in a series of questions. What would happen to Australia if we ramped up the pace significantly? Imagine if uh, we did another three sectors in the next two years, even if we just did pricing comparison. We went beyond banking, we did superannuation and we did uh, insurance and we did telecommunications, we did healthcare, um, just like Tim's been doing. Um, so if we do those things, what does that mean? Um, how could the, our society be different? If we had the pandemic in six months time um, or six years time, and APIs were prevalent and digital capability was all over the place. What networks and how responsive could we be? How could we adapt quickly? Um, I think in, in a regime like the consumer data, right, from my personal opinion is speed is critical. It is better to go fast, safe, safely, obviously we don't want to have any security breaches, but it is better to go fast than slow. And I'd rather do fast but small and MVP it rather than be slow and then by the time we actually deliver a sector, no one cares anymore. What if sectors started to do this voluntarily? What if um, the superannuation industry decided, actually, we're not going to wait for the designation to come along and for the government to say you must do it. What if they embraced the CDR and said, we will voluntarily implement some CDR standards. Can you make some for us? If you make the standards, we'll do them. We won't wait for rules. We'll just go ahead and do it. Um, even if you didn't get the whole sector, even if 80% of the people in, in, engaged, then instead of it being a compulsory activity, it was a voluntary activity. Imagine how fast we could proceed. How many sectors could we get ahead of the ball and actually set the standards for themselves, for their own needs, and, uh, and with an understanding of their customers that personally I don't have, et cetera. Um, so that, that's a real opportunity. A lot of people are hanging back and saying, oh, this is a regulatory thing now. I'm going to wait and hopefully it never comes to my sector. There's an opportunity here for it to get ahead and then you won't need to be regulated. You'll be free of that regulation for a long period of time, even though you do have the APIs and can benefit from it. Um, what if the CDR includes actions and updates? At the moment, it's only read. Um, what happens if it's... Um, actions and updates um, uh, what if we do rights in the banking sector what if we did payment it's in the electricity sector what if we had uh, the ability to switch retailers in the superannuation sector what if i could um, uh, do the whole uh, superannuation rollover through apis all those things um, what would that look like and what could we do um, and i think that's important the farrell report uh, number two it's currently looking at this question. We're waiting with bated breath to see what they recommend, but I think that could be a really interesting thing um, for where we go next. And the next one is, if you like, more provocative, which is what if social media was designated? There's been a lot of focus on traditional, and I'm not picking on social media, I just use them as an example of a, an already technically enabled environment that's heavy in data usage, but not necessarily good at giving customers control of their data. Um, a lot of the focus has been on traditional industries that are already heavily regulated, banking, insurance, telecommunications, energy, these sorts of things. There's already lots of regulation on those industries, virtually none around social media. What if social media was brought into the consumer data right and I had the ability to say to Facebook, you need to give all of the data you have about me to a third party so that I can have a service from them. How would the world be different if that was the case? And why shouldn't I be able to do that? If, if we accept that you should be able to do it for banking, why shouldn't I accept that I shouldn't be able to do it for social media, Facebook, Twitter, so on and so forth, or cars? All of these things are absolutely um, rich areas where we could focus on for the future in these regards.
Uh, that's all I had to say. In the pack, um, there is a slide at the very end with a bunch of resources. So when that's available, feel free to go and have a look at those and follow up those links. And now I'll hand it to you, Sarah. Thank you, James, uh, for a really informative uh, session. And uh, I think you have given us a great overview of the, the open banking and also the CDR standard. Um, I'm sure we are all very keen to see how the uh, CDR will be adopted in other industries as well going forward. So um, we have been having a few questions uh, on the stage. Uh, I'll go through them one by one. Um, what happens if a sector voluntary, one voluntarily uh, implements a standard and then, however, the government would mandate a different set of controls? Ah, excellent question. Well, the answer to that is we wouldn't. Uh, the data standards body does the uh, does the standards. Um, with what we've been talking about is if a sector wants to do it voluntarily, I'd be more than happy to work with them so that it was aligned to the principles. Um, and the data standards chair who gets to set the standards would say, yeah, that looks good to me. And then if you implemented that, it wouldn't be different. You know, we would govern the standard. It's just voluntary whether to implement it or not. That's actually a protection so that if you do invest, you're not investing down a corridor. Um, what will, if, if someone just goes and builds their own APIs and releases them today and then the CDR comes, there is no guarantee that we will align to that. But if we did do it the other way and we were involved in the process, then even without a designation, we could be aligned, if you like. Okay. And um, do you have other examples of uh, any other countries which have implemented this kind of um, countrywide standardization? No. We're first. Yay, uh, go Australia. That's encouraging to hear. Okay. And um, uh, other jurisdictions the... have been looking. I will say other huh? jurisdictions are watching closely what we're doing. Yeah. And we get contacts occasionally um, with interested parties saying, um, well, we're con considering doing this. Um, quite significant countries as well. So um, people are really watching the Australian CDR. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, reflecting on the journey so far, uh, what is the one thing that you would do dif differently, if any at all? Uh, I definitely focus on hiring better engagement people. Uh, I'm just joking. That's I'm, I know the person <laughs> that asked that question. The, um, uh, the one thing I would do differently, um, uh, I would have focused on the information security implications earlier. You know, there was a, you know, very early on in the writing of the standards, we focused on data. We focused on the data payloads and things like that. I probably would have rushed into how we do authentication of consumers and those sorts of things earlier. There is one thing in particular that I would have done much earlier if I'd, if I'd been, been able to influence it at the time, and that is CX research. We now do extensive customer experience research, um, but we would have brought that in a lot sooner if we'd known how important it was going to be. Okay. And you mentioned that we are the first to uh, going on the CDR approach. Uh, are there other countries or jurisdictions looking at the CDR approach as an option as well? Yes, very much so. So various, um, now don't get me wrong, there are lots of API standards. The UK has done a lot of open banking and things mm -hmm. like that. A lot of different people have standards. But when we're talking about a consumer data right, giving consumers control over multiple sectors, that is not something that has been, that's a lot more aggressive than other, other jurisdictions have done. Um, but there are other countries that are actively looking at it. I won't speak for them, but we're, as I said, we're being watched closely. And there's a comment there saying, has China not implemented standards? Well, they may have, but the whole point of the consumer data right is about customer consent. The customer gets to say who you share the data with, what data gets shared, how long it gets shared for, I can stop it. That's not necessarily a focus of Chinese standards. Okay. Um... And uh, can you point out any examples of applications which implement the open API, open banking APIs? Yeah, so this currently, I mentioned there were two um, accredited data recipients live at the moment. Yeah. One is Frollo. Mm -hmm. Frollo's implemented uh, personal finance management um, and they're live at the moment. So you can go and download that and link up your banks using CDR. Another one is Regional Australia Bank, which if, if you're looking for a home loan and you're interested in Regional Australia Bank, they've in integrated it into their loan application process. Um, the ACCC are currently going through the process with, I think, a, a more than 30 additional FinTechs bringing them on board and getting them through the accreditation process. So I think in the next six months, we'll see a lot more products introduced that are using the CDR rails and, um, and hopefully we'll be in the dozens and dozens of fintechs range by this time next year. 
Excellent. Thank you very much for your time. I think we have run out of time now. So I'll move on to the next Thank you very much. Thanks, James.